Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. July Roundup actually coming a few days after July finished. A little bit of a novelty on this channel right now. <laughs> There's only two videos ago that I was doing the June Roundup, but I am trying to get back on schedule, so yeah, here we are. I feel like it was a really dynamic month for releases. A lot of different kinds of records came out and most of them were pretty good. There was only one record I really didn't like this month, and I'm sure even before I start, most of you can guess which album that was. Before we start, I just want to quickly plug the new Deep Cuts Discord server. This is something I set up last week. Um, um, it was really to take over uh, the Google Hangouts party that we had going on for listening parties and things like that. The Discord server is open to everybody all the time. We have a number of different discussion rooms within the server and really it just I want to inspire more discussion about music from the community. And the comment section of these videos has been fantastic ever since the channel started. A really good place for people to talk about music. But this is just somewhere you can take it as well and it's a bit more of a fluid conversation because, because of the way that Discord's set up. If you haven't used Discord before, come and try it out. It's, uh, it's, it, I don't think it's going to be like other Discord servers if you do know what Discord's like. It, it's been a really friendly community so far. The mods and admins that I've got working with me have been brilliant. They've really set up a nice place. So if you really feel like coming and having a bit more of an in-depth discussion with people about music, talk about music, get introduced to new artists, all that sort of thing, come and join us and say hello. Another packed month of releases, so let's get stuck in. Dizzy Rascal. Rasket. Dizzy Rascal's back, and better than last time, which really isn't saying a great deal. <laughs> if you've heard the fifth, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus Christ, not a very good record. Dizzy, in many ways, created the grime scene. Along with artists like Wiley and other UK garage acts that were starting this new aggressive style, they helped create this scene that came out of East London, Bow in East London. And a lot of those artists move across to the pop sphere quite quickly into the mid noughties So many artists that did that, Wiley being one of them, and Dizzy Rascal was one of them too. But a lot of them then returned to that original grime sound. For instance, we had Wiley's Godfather record released this year. And now we've got Dizzy returning to that grime sound after a long time. But it did take him a lot longer to return. So in 2013, he released The Fifth, which was a collection of pop dance EDM tracks with people on it like Sean Kingston and uh, Jesse J. Whilst he was doing this, these other grime artists had already decided to move on with the sound or say move on, go back to the original sound that was, it had a bit more credibility to it. But he's back in 2017 with Rasket and it's very much a sound that recalls the music he was making before Maths and English. Maths and English was the last grime record that he made really, and even that had elements of the mainstream pop sound to them. I would say that this album most closely recalls his debut album, Boy in the Corner, which is an absolute classic if you haven't heard it, but you have tracks like The Other Side that have this metallic sound to them, which you can hear if you listen to Boy in the Corner. It has a, an aggressive cynicism and an honesty that made his earlier work so fresh. The track Ghost brilliantly harnesses this flighty flute part and an attacking, saw synth sound, and Dizzy reflects on his rise to success. Elsewhere, he gets political as well. He talks about the housing crisis on the track Everything Must Go, and he even samples Theresa May and Boris Johnson talking at conferences. He also throws shade on the current crop of grime artists on the track What Are You Gonna Do? But I'm not really a fan of the position that he takes on refuting artists like Stormzy and Skepta, though. And in a recent interview with The Guardian, he talked about Stormzy's gang sign and prayers not being grime because it's got elements of gospel in it, which, okay, is fair enough. But then in the next sentence, he claims he's doing something truly original with his sound. But is he? The sound on Rasket is derivative of the original grime sound. Hell, I mean, even my my favourite grime record of the year, Godfather, is derivative in a way because it's, it's throwing back to that original grime sound. That scene isn't there in the same way anymore. So there, those artists are calling back those ideas and those themes they'd already talked about before. Uh, and that's fine, but it feels even more derivative that Dizzy's come back to this even later than everybody else. And now he's refuting the other grime artists doing it because it feels like maybe he felt like he was running out of steam on the pop front and needed a change of tact in his career. And this probably was the best way of doing it. So yes, this record is good, but Dizzy's braggadocio is just feels a little bit tired these days. You're, you're relatively speaking doing the same thing as other grime artists are in the scene. Don't think you're not. You're not doing the same cuttingly original work as stuff in Boy in the Corner. This is not 2003, 2004 anymore. You know, celebrate the scene that you've created like Wiley does on Godfather. Make some friends for fuck's sake. Broken Social Scene, Hug of Thunder. Canadian music collective Broken Social Scene's fifth LP is, to be honest, 
Brilliant. Hug of Thunder feels like a joyous cacophony. It's absolutely packed with these infectious riffs, crossing vocal harmonies, interjecting brass, leaping synth tones. There's so much to unpack here, which I suppose is something that is to be expected from a collective of 15 musicians. I mean, fans of Broken Social Scene will already be used to this approach, and some people maybe find it a little bit overwhelming, but I personally love it. After the intro, the track Halfway Home sets the scene with a soaring vocal harmony underpinned with this fat bass tone and linear drum patterns. And it was only a minute and a half into the track that guitars and synths glitter as everything builds towards this a monumental go around at a chorus. It's a, a really fantastic chorus. It, you know, if you have a good chorus at the beginning of an album, that does set you up well for the rest of the record. Um, and, and it really does that, but also the rest of the record does not disappoint. They really follow through on that songwriting. It's such an emotive track, but it also feels very celebratory. And I think a lot of that has to do with knowing how many people are involved in the creation of this track. You know, there could be all these people that are coming together and collectively making this music. I would love to see this performed live. The track Protest Song is built with so many guitar layers, I can't even count them. Uh, but it never feels messy. Every single line that's written complements one another. It's deftly constructed by these musicians. It's also important to mention their ability to pull off nuance as well as these other explosive tracks. If you take title track Hug of Thunder for example, it pulsates along and it's anchored by this steady bass line as Ariel Engel's voice wistfully floats across the track and it's so ethereal, it's a, it's a lovely piece of work. A really satisfying record and I would say something that seems to be getting better every time I return to it just because there's so much here. Um, yeah, go and listen. Boris, dear. Boris! Japanese noise, drone, rock, experimental, doom, psych <laughs> trio. Uh, Boris, they're celebrating their 25th year in 2017, and as a result, we've got their 24th LP, Deer. That 24th LP, that doesn't count all of the collaborations they've done. They've done a lot of stuff. Honestly, such a fascinating band. They are a bit of a musical enigma and the different, all the different styles and sounds they've done over the last 25 years. So much to dig into. I'm very tempted to do a big guide video on Boris because I think there's a lot to talk about. So maybe that'll be coming in the future. Anyway, with Dear, Boris have used the opportunity of their anniversary to celebrate the wide array of musical styles that they've gone through throughout their career. And so as a result, this record sits somewhere between the crushing drone doom of their earlier work, and then also the poppier, sincerely catchy melodies of albums like Pink. This is the juxtaposition that defines the album. You have thick, doomy, effects-laden guitars and funereal slow drums, but it's all elevated by Atsuo Takeshi and Wata's vocals. They create a really nice juxtaposition there, which maybe you think wouldn't work, but it really does in this context. And it's something that does work so well. The album achieves a kind of dynamism, and that's due to the fact that these three musicians aren't afraid of taking past songwriting techniques and ideas and sort of mashing them together in this really satisfying way. The aching slow doom sound of a track like Dead Song fits really well alongside the more punky, anthemic Absolute Go, which is also the title of their first debut album. So they are going on a bit of a nostalgia trip here as well. Beyond is a gorgeous track. It pulls back in these shoegazy, hazy sections before pummeling back in with this hammering guitar sound. The near 12 minute epic Dystopia Vanishing Point achieves the same effect. You have vocal harmonies creating a melancholia that enhances that doom-esque sound when it does eventually return to the track. It's just really great to hear this band still going and still releasing good material. It's probably the most accessible Boris record yet, and if you haven't ever listened to a Boris album, I would start here and then work your way along to some of the other pieces of work they've done. Um, but yeah, it's a good album. Tyler the Creator, Flower Boy. Probably the most talked about record in July, and for good reason. Tyler the Creator's Flower Boy is undoubtedly the best thing he's put out so far. It's a nuanced, reflective album, and it's so far away from those previous shock rap records, things like Goblin and Cherry Bomb. What makes this project so successful is the move from aggressive production to an R&B influence slickness. Uh, and it doesn't lose that unique sense of personality that Tyler's music has always had. You know, um, perhaps he's more influenced by friend and fellow collaborator Frank Ocean than we realize. I mean, in a recent interview, he did say that he preferred Blonde over Channel Orange. So perhaps he is pardon the pun, channeling <laughs> Frank's sound um, more than we realise. Uh, but, but not in a derivative way at all. This project feels wholly of its own. It's just taking a slightly different approach, similar to what his friend does. That's key here as a comparison, because like Blonde, Flower Boy has a reflexive, 
untethered quality to much of its songwriting. It doesn't feel the need to endlessly repeat refrains. It, songs have like a fluidity to them and that gives the record a dreamlike quality. Of course Frank actually does turn up <laughs> at the beginning of the album on the second track Where the Flower Blooms and it, it kind of sets up like a sonic precedent for the rest of the album. By the time I got to the track See You Again on my first listen I realised that this album was harnessing something very special. If you look back to Tylee's earlier kind of abrasive production lyricism, it was very rough around the edges. It was bold, but rough around the edges. And that was kind of the point. But with this new sound, um, I mean, this track specifically, it reveals a real deafness in his production approach that you haven't heard before. You've got brief tune percussive refrains, you've got analog synths, warm bass tones. It feels like everything's been really well thought out on this track to create this dreamlike quality that he manages to tether throughout the album. And the same goes for the lyricism on this track. It's a love song, but it doesn't sound saccharine. And even thinking about Tyler's earlier antics earlier on in his career, it never feels disingenuous. I'm kind of torn by the track Who Dat Boy, because even even though I think it is a banger of a track, and I think if you've heard the track, you will completely agree with me, it does sort of fracture the flow and the mood of the album. And even a track like I Ain't Got Time, which goes a lot harder than some of the other tracks here, it has an idiosyncratic production and a dreamy quality that gives off a similar vibe to the rest of the album. And I don't feel like Who Dat Boy does have that dreamlike quality. I feel like it's a great song, but perhaps it it's a little bit out of place on this album. I'm just really impressed by the record in general. Tyler's finally built something that reflects his true talent as a songwriter and a producer. One of the best releases of the month. Arcade Fire, everything now. Well, here comes the one record I really did not like this month. We did a listening party for this one, but by the time we hit the last few tracks, I don't think anybody was talking about the album anymore. I think most of us were pretty shocked at quite how bad this album is. What happened to Arcade Fire? Their first three records, Funeral, Neon Bible and The Suburbs, made a, a brilliant trio of bold and brave music that had something to say. Granted, I didn't particularly like Reflector, but I appreciated that they were changing their sound a little bit and they were trying something new. They were experimenting with what their, what their band was capable of. Uh, I was really hoping they were going to attempt to recapture the magic of the pre-Reflector period on this album, but they uh, they didn't. Everything now is being compared by many as Arcade Fire doing ABBA, but I really feel like that does a disservice to the swathe of classic pop tracks that ABBA put out in the 70s. Sure, the sonic palette of Everything Now recalls 70s disco, kaleidoscopic pop, but without one single memorable hook. The whole thing numbly plods on right from the opening all the way through to that closer. The band went really hard with their marketing campaign on this one and they framed the concept of the record as a critique of this post-everything society from fake news to the glut of infinite content. Shame the music is absolutely dead in the water. I don't know if Wynn and Co thought they were being clever by writing purposely forgettable pop irritations with <laughs> slathering sort of high school level pseudo-political bullshit all over it, um, but it's lost on me. The, the satire became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think I'd given up on this album by the time we got to the track Peter Pan, which is an irksome fucking track. Um, what about that bobbing brass led track Chemistry? Oh, Jesus Christ. Just what a fall from grace. Christian Scott. Diaspora. Christian Scott Atunde Ajua is a trumpeter, songwriter, musician, producer, hailing originally from New Orleans. He put out one of my favourite jazz records of the last few years in 2015 with Stretch Music, a really gorgeous spiritual jazz record that has a real timeless quality to it, despite the fact that he uses modern musical elements to diversify his sound. If you need further convincing, you should also check out his cover of the Tom York track, The Eraser, which is uh, a really great take on that piece of music. In 2017, he's back with his new project, The Centennial Trilogy, which is three albums he's releasing over this year, which speak to the struggles of living in modern day life, very specifically the struggles of African-American citizens. Diaspora is the middle record of the trilogy and the third one's due out at some point at the end of the year. And with this album, Christian takes his fusion of musical styles even further than he did on an album like Stretch Music. He utilizes instrumental hip hop looping and sampling. Even Trap on the final track, The Walk, and it has Ellen Pindicue's firebrand flute work, Lord over this half-time trap beat. Didn't think it was gonna work, but it is so good. It's really exciting to hear an artist so in tune with jazz and modern styles that he's able to fuse both together 
organically without it coming across as gimmicky. In fact, it makes you think, why doesn't this happen more often? Because it's so successful when Scott does it, but then perhaps you, you need Scott's immense talent to pull that off. On the track Lawless, for example, Corey Fonville's snare hits are suddenly replaced with electronic samples, and it creates this vivid fusion of acoustic and electronic, and it frames Christian's own stunning trumpet soloing so well. Christian Scott continues to amaze me. Brilliant stuff. Shabazz Palaces, Kazars, Born on a Gangster Star, and Kazars versus the Jealous Machines. I've made no secret in the past my love for Shabazz Palaces, the experimental hip-hop duo comprised of Tender Mirare and Ishmael Butler, formerly from the brilliant Diggable Planets. Their first two LPs, Black Up and Leslie Majesty, are two of the best things to come out of this decade, in my opinion. They're bold and expressive, and they're both been on endless repeats since their release. So I had a lot of anticipation for this new dual album release. We have Kazars Born on a Gangster Star and Kazars versus The Jealous Machines. For me, what these two releases amount to are very impressive experimental endeavors from Shabazz Palaces. You have two dense records that demand attention from the listener as they fly across this cosmic Afrofuturist world packed with analog textures, deep sub bass and ethereal synth landscapes, often completely untethered by any kind of percussion, which really gives you the feeling that you're floating around, sort of just having to experience this, this strange world that they've created. Mark my words, these albums will take time to settle with you. They'll take time to click. It's not like on Black Up, you have the immediate tracks like Are You, Can You, Were You, a track that really just connects with you melodically not like that. This is not how this album operates. Marrera and Butler clearly want you to feel a sense of disembodiment as you navigate across these two albums, and they have absolutely achieved that. Like most dense projects, though, the longer you take with it, the more rewarding it will be, and you will understand its qualities as you give it time. I have to admit, on my first listen through, I felt initially disappointed because it doesn't have the immediacy of those first two records, but what I came to realise on multiple listens is that lack of immediacy is actually a strength for the songwriting on this. Take opening track Since Kea from Kazar's Born on a Gangster Star, and it synthesizes these fizzing samples and phasing effects with the acoustic warmth of skinned percussion, and Butler's delivery sort of lazily just drips over everything. A track like the instrumental De Say Du Sang is highlighted with its evocative synth tones, and they actually sound like stars twinkling against a black night sky, which does recall not only the album art, but also just this cosmic universe that Marrera and Butler have crafted. Of course, the record is as conceptual as it initially sounds, and you have the character Kazars being disgusted by the failures of a murder cut, and this allows Butler to address key issues like police brutality and the negative advent of technology as well. Uh, and whilst keeping the palette as far into the skies as they want to. It's a really nice way of being able to talk about key socio-political concerns, but also have your music untethered from convention, which is what they've done here. Between the two, Born on a Gangster Star has a slightly more traditional sonic landscape than Versus the Machines, which is even bolder with its modern musical flavors. Listen to the track Atlantis. Every time the synth tone comes in, it clips, and it just makes the whole track feel as if it's gonna collapse in inwardly on itself, and it also gives the the whole landscape a very digital quality to it, which you aren't getting on certain other tracks, which highlight the more acoustic warmth of things like the skin percussion, for example. It's a really nice dichotomy of different feels and styles that they've managed to do with these two albums. Overall, there's so much to enjoy and appreciate about these two records. I'm excited to get into some discussions about them and see what people's initial reactions were versus perhaps a couple of listens down the line, because I think it, it, they are hard albums to get into, but when you do, it'll be worth it. AV Tear, Eucalyptus. So for those of you that don't know, A.V. Tear, real name Dave Portner, is best known as vocalist of Animal Collective, um, a band that seems to be very much loved around these parts. The A.V. Tear releases so far have left me feeling pretty cold. They feel a little bit floundering, lots of textures and ideas, but it's all done in a bit of a limp-wristed way. There's no assertive quality to them, and to me it ends up sounding like a collection of vaguely connected thoughts that are bumping into one another. Eucalyptus is probably the best A.V. Tear solo release so far. This time the textures feel like they're more purposefully abstract, they're not just bumping into each other consequentially, there is actually a purpose and a reasoning behind them. The release is described by A.V. Tear himself as an electroacoustic movement through leaves, rocks and dust and I feel like that's something you can hear in the opening track Season High with its muffled acoustic guitar chords and it has a resonant synth expression and much of this disparate sounds here 
almost they do build an environment much like the way a physical landscape might. So I can I can kind of get where he's coming from with this concept. This continues throughout the record. A track like Jackson 5 has a confidence in stopping and starting its rhythmic underpinning and it gives the whole track a kind of bouncy euphoria. I, I quite like this track actually. It um, this and the opening track, Season High, really achieve a sense of environment. Like the early releases though, it still feels relatively messy to me. It's it, taken as a full project, it feels too sprawling. Now, there's so many different ideas here that come and go, and many of them don't really leave much of a lasting impression. I know this is exactly the approach Portner likes taking, and that's his. That's kind of his songwriting technique anyway for much of the time, so it's really just a lot of it's down to personal preference. But I feel like his songwriting talent is better suited when he goes through a bit of a process of refinement. All in all, eh, okay. Okay, so like last month, they were the main records that I reviewed. There are a couple of other albums that I listened to also, but I don't feel like I can go into them too much detail because I didn't give them quite as much time, but I still want to give you my thoughts on them. So here we go. Nine Inch Nails, Ad Violence. Another rippling and powerful LP from Trent Reznor and now resident Nine Inch Nails member Atticus Ross. It's insanely exciting to see Nine Inch Nails continually putting out great work. Opening song Less Than is a bruising track. It's memorable hook, clearly relished by the snarling Reznor. Such a recognisable snarl and it's just welcoming to hear him back again after that first EP that we got towards the beginning of the year. The nightmarish quality of the track, The Lovers, is perforated with these deep piano chords. The whole thing really does unsettle because you expect it to resolve at some point, but it just doesn't resolve. Maybe you shouldn't expect it to resolve because it's Nine Inch Nails, <laughs> but it feels like the whole track, at some point it will resolve to like a cadence and it, and it doesn't, which is, is so unsettling, but so brilliantly realized by these guys. Final track, The Background World, descends into steadily distorting glitching noise and it leaves you wondering what that final Nine Inch Nails EP of the year might sound like. Waxahachie, Out in the Storm. Kate Crutchfield's fourth Waxahachie record, Out in the Storm, it is a breakup record really and it's made with razor guitar riffs, passion and intensity. A track like Silver is a straightforward but propelled rock track and it's it's all brought together by Katie's sugared vocal delivery. Brass Beam is a road trip track, if I ever heard one, and it's really really relishes its distorted two chord repetition, its dual vocal harmonies. I enjoyed this album, but it didn't make that much of an impact on me after those 10 tracks were up. I mean, Katie is a strong songwriter, but I suppose there just wasn't anything particularly to catch me on this album. Some nice tracks, but not anything particularly special. Manchester Orchestra, a black mile to the surface. I wasn't really expecting much from this record. The albums that Manchester Orchestra have put out so far in their career haven't really impressed me up until this point. The Atlanta Georgia Band have tried a couple of different sounds throughout the previous four releases, and I feel like none of them has stuck quite as well as this sound seems to. This style of music seems to really um, be a successful iteration of their songwriting craft. It's nuanced Americana really, but there is more depth to the songwriting than initially meets the eye. This isn't sunny Americana indie. This, there's a wash of darkness to these tracks. The Wolf, for example, is a simmering track with this undercurrent of synth buzz, a really rousing song. Tracks like The Alien prove the ability the band has at subtlety, and they pull off emotion with the smallest of brush strokes on that track. And I really like the nuance in the songwriting on that. I liked this album. I can see myself coming back to it again. I didn't have time to listen to The Fool's new record, but I think I'm going to probably try and include that in August's review roundup because, you know, it came out on the 28th. You guys will let me off that, right? Two, three days? You'll let me off. So that was my July review roundup. Thanks for watching. Make sure you comment down below on your favourite albums of July. Let me know what your thoughts are on the albums I talked about, whether you agree or disagree with me. Let's have some discussions. If you want to have further discussions and join the new community, make sure you come and join the Dis Deep Cuts Discord server. Link down below for that one. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I'll be back next week. See you soon.